Everything was against us. Everything. Lieutenant Commander 19 Anandro Yadav. Davalim, Goa the 22nd of May 2009. It had been six months since 10 Pakistani terrorists had entered Mumbai from the sea in November 2008, holding the city hostage for four whole days and massacring 166 people across three locations. The 26 11th attacks would occupy India's national security system for years to come. But just six months later, it was by far the biggest thing on the country's mind. By May 2009, as a wounded country attempted to make sense of the invasion and horror, the burden of keeping a watchful eye over the Arabian Sea had increased dramatically. India, it was clear, had let inevitable gaps in surveillance and intelligence be terrifyingly manipulated by foreign terror machinery focused on spilling blood on Indian soil. In the months after 26 11 it became clear that for all its ambitions as a regional power, India had let slip from its mind one of Jawaharlal Nehru's most memorable quotes on strategy, to be secure on land, we must be supreme at sea. The terror attack was a devastating jolt, but it served to amplify the inevitable, that India's problems from the sea could only multiply. The steady audacity of pirates on the high seas, pushing ever closer to Indian waters, had been keeping the Indian Navy feverishly busy throughout 2008. And when Ashmal Amir Kassab and his fellow terrorists stepped ashore from their rubber dinghy, India was about to be violently roused to the dangers the sea could present. As Mumbai burnt, hundreds of kilometers away, at Goa's Dabalim airbase, groups of naval officers Saturday wrapped in front of television screens, taking in the enormity of what was happening on their watch. Even before it became clear that the terrorists murdering people in Mumbai had come from Pakistan, military personnel across the country automatically knew they would be expected to be in a heightened state of readiness. For anything. From air force bases to army infantry units and naval strike formations, explicit orders did not need to be given for men and women to brace themselves for what they were trained for. Among them was 38-year-old Lieutenant C.D.R. 19 Anandro Yadav. Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav knew instantly that his unit would have an exponentially bigger role to play in what lay ahead for India. He was right. Just days after 26 11, India officially bestowed its navy with greater defense responsibilities. Already stretched thin by virtue of being the smallest of the three armed forces, but with the largest domain of responsibility, including a 7,517-kilometer coastline, the navy collectively flexed its muscle as it assumed the role of guardian against every conceivable threat from the sea. By May 2009, the navy had possibly never been busier. Along with the grueling after-effects of 26 11 on maritime security, the Indian Navy was preparing for another event with far-reaching ramifications, the expected delivery of a Chinese-built warship to Pakistan, the first of a new generation of lethal ships Islamabad had purchased for nearly $1 billion. The F-22P Zulfikor class missile frigate was expected to sail from Shanghai to Karachi in 2009. At Dabalim, Lt. C.D.R. Yadav and other naval aviators with the INAS-315 winged stallions had their mission cut out for them. Early on the 22nd of May, the base received word that two Pakistan Navy warships were expected to transit southward through the Arabian Sea, possibly in preparation to escort the brand new Zulfikor back to Karachi a few weeks later. Snooping on each other's ships in the Arabian Sea has been standard operating procedure for India and Pakistan for decades. So the search and surveillance shadow mission that Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav and his crew were tasked with that May morning was not much more than routine. But volatility in relations between the two countries post-26 11th meant that even routine surveillance missions carried substantially greater risk. The aircraft Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav and his crew would be flying that day was IN-305, a Soviet-era Ilyushin Il-38, a large ocean surveillance aeroplane with four turbo-propeller engines. Fitted with advanced sensors to detect ships and submarines, this eye-in-the-sky aircraft can also fire torpedoes to destroy submarines or missiles to sink ships. The Il-38 is little known or recognized beyond the military and the world of aviation enthusiasts. It is not a particularly arresting sight.
and being tucked away at the Goa Naval Air Station has helped to maintain a low profile that suits its typically classified surveillance duties. In 2002, however, the Eel 38 entered public consciousness in a devastating manner when two aircraft collided mid-air over Goa during a flying display to celebrate the squadron's Silver Jubilee. Twelve Navy personnel perished in the freak tragedy. Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav could well have been on board one of the doomed planes. It was something he would never forget each time he strapped himself in before a flight, just as he did seven years later, that morning in May. After a brief chat with his navigator and systems operators, Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav and the rest of his eight-man crew clambered into their Eel 38 through a hatch in the aircraft's belly, the aircraft has no other entry points. The two pilots strapped themselves into the seats in the cockpit. A flight signaler and a flight engineer took the seats in a small space behind the pilots. And in a cabin in the rear, four navigators cum sensor and systems operators sat a day at their electronic consoles. The crew's mission that morning was to fly straight to a patch of ocean where they expected to encounter a pair of Pakistan Navy warships, a tanker and an armed frigate, identify both and gather as much information as possible about them, including their visuals and electromagnetic signatures. In a routine surveillance mission, Lt. C.D.R. Yadav and his crew would have had authorization to buzz the Pakistani warships, swoop down low and make it obvious that they had been spotted, a maritime equivalent of gotcha, part of the endless cat and mouse chase at sea. But during this mission, the crew only needed to locate and shadow the Pakistani warships. Under no circumstances would the crew put the aircraft in any danger. Pakistan Navy warships were known to be fitted with Chinese-built surface-to-air missile systems capable of easily hitting an aircraft as big and so as an Eel-38. With permission to depart on that blazing hot morning, Eel-38 IN-305 roared off. The Dabalim tarmac and climbed out over the Arabian Sea, heading due east towards its target. On board the aircraft, all systems reported normal. While the two pilots gently eased the aircraft higher, the navigator and operators made preparations for the mission objectives, corroborating their map coordinates and tuning up the sensors which they would switch on only when they were close to the two Pakistani warships. On board the plane, the crew wore intercom headsets to communicate with each other and with ground control. Without the headsets, the Eel 38's four Ivchenko AI-20M propeller engines would drown out every other sound in the cockpit and cabin. Even a pressurized, reinforced cabin could only keep so much of the sound out. The crew checked in with ground control, indicating that they were now over the high seas. An hour had passed. The Eel 38 was flying at 21,000 feet over deep, blue ocean, about 550 kilometers off the coast of Goa. The flight navigator signaled to the crew that they were now very close to the target, alerting the mission systems operators to get ready for the task. But as the crew prepared to descend slightly and begin its shadowing mission, they felt a small shudder pass through the 70-ton aircraft. It took Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav a few seconds to realize what had happened. And it couldn't possibly have come at a worse time. The Eel 38 had eight electric generators providing power to virtually every system in the aircraft. Like a pack of dominoes, each generator abruptly sputtered and died. In a matter of seconds, the entire aircraft was stripped of electrical power and every single one of its systems was suddenly suspended right before they were needed the most. But it was not just the mission that had been jeopardized by stalled equipment. The very lives of those eight men now hung in the balance. Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav instantly realized that he and his crew were sitting on a ticking time bomb. Oil fed into the engines was controlled electrically. So was the temperature of the oil. When the generators failed, the oil cooler shutters got stuck and couldn't be moved since they were electromechanically operated. Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav stared in horror at his dying cockpit instruments. He knew the ideal temperature of engine oil was 70 degrees Celsius with an emergency limit that stretched up to 100 degrees Celsius. The gauges informed him that the oil temperature in the engines had crossed 150 degrees Celsius. It was very simple. The four screaming engines could explode at any moment. The aircraft now completely stripped of electrical power and the cockpit and cabin lit by the red glow of a solitary emergency lamp, 
the pilot's lost engine indicators, crucial data necessary to keep the aircraft safe and not turn into a ball of fire hurtling into the Arabian Sea. With all instruments either dying or dead, Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav took his partner's altimeter. His own was electrically powered and rendered useless. I had no navigation, no communication and limited control over my engines. I was doing my best not to touch the throttles. I knew that a single abrupt move could cause the engines to explode, Lieutenant. C.D.R. Yadav remembers. The engines weren't the only thing screaming on board IN-305. With their intercom headsets now rendered useless, the men on board had to literally scream instructions at each other to be heard. The crew of IN-305 had few friends in the air that afternoon, and many adversaries. Starting with the generators, virtually everything turned against them in a chain reaction of terrifying circumstance. Every minute brought with it a fresh piece of reality that pushed the crew ever closer to giving up. The Eel 38, built for extended missions over sea, was full of fuel that morning. 26 tons of aviation kerosene for the four hungry engines. The mission commanders at Goa had wanted to give the aircraft crew enough endurance and range to shadow the Pakistani warships adequately before returning to base. That mission, of course, had now gone straight out of the window. The one thing Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav knew he needed to do was descend so he could allow the navigator to get his bearings. But there was a dilemma. Diving to a lower altitude meant feeding the engines thicker air, which could put an additional strain on them and accelerate a disaster. Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav waited, making a series of rapid calculations in the air, something he had learned to do as a young lieutenant. Using the artificial horizon, a thankfully analog instrument that tells pilots the orientation of their aircraft relative to the Earth's horizon, Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav took charge and gently steered IN-305 towards India's west coast. In his lap was an emergency compass, the size of a rupee coin. Every other navigational aid was dead. With the gentlest possible touch he could muster for a large aircraft that had nothing gentle about it, Lieutenant. C.D.R. Yadav pushed it into slow descent to about 7,000 feet. As the aircraft lumbered uncertainly through the thicker air, Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav looked out of his side window at the whining propellers. Then he looked over at the younger pilot next to him, and the other men standing behind him. He knew he had to do it. I briefed the crew in no uncertain terms. I told them that if the engine started exploding, we had no choice but to bail out. No thinking twice, on my command, we would jump out through the aircraft's belly hatch with our parachutes over the seat, Lieutenant. C.D.R. Yadav recalls. Jumping out of an Eel 38 was a daunting proposition. Unlike other aircraft that had rear ramps or exit doors that were clear of the aircraft's propellers, exiting from the belly hatch of IN-305 would send the crew careening through space between the two inner propellers on both wings. A tiny bit of abrupt turbulence could send them headfirst into the equivalent of a giant blender. There would be nothing left of them. His crew stared back at him. He was the most experienced man on the plane. His word would be final. If he ordered them to jump, that was precisely what they would do. There was no doubt in their minds. What they would do once they landed with the parachutes in the middle of the Arabian Sea was a problem they would tackle once they got to it. The crew waited. Every one of the eight men hoped they wouldn't need to exit the aircraft over the ocean. A set of four emergency batteries on board the aircraft were in a precarious state after the generators perished, but still had a few wisps of voltage left. Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav picked up his high-frequency radio transmitter and beamed out a message he hoped would be caught by airliners in the surrounding airspace. The emergency battery indicators suddenly plummeted to near zero, ruling out that last vestige of communication with the outside world. A minute later, the batteries were dead too. IN-305 was now 100% bereft of any direct or stored electrical power. We were flying by the seat of our pants and hoping to make it back. The worry for me was, if we make it back, how do we land? Says Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav. An Eel 38 that had finished its mission and expended its heavy load of fuel was automatically rendered light enough to land safely. But without the ability to dump fuel off the aircraft, the crew of IN-305 was locked into what was a veritable missile. 
Lieutenant C.D. Yadav wiped his brow with the back of his hands. About 450 kilometers off the coast, he lowered the aircraft's wheels, a hydraulic process. A fresh dilemma presented itself, and Lieutenant C.D. Yadav knew he had bare minutes to make a decision. With all our fuel on board that we couldn't get rid of, we were 18 to 20 tons heavier than permissible landing weight. The wings had flaps to lower the approach speed, but wouldn't budge an inch without electrical power, he says. A safe landing speed on the Eel 38 is no more than 200 kmph. Without his flaps to slow the aircraft down, IN-305 would hurtle towards the runway at 300 kmph, an unacceptably high speed. As if a dangerously heavy, unacceptably fast and almost uncontrollable aircraft coming in for a landing was not enough for the crew to deal with, they also had to contend with the fact that it was pre-monsoon season. The runway at Goa's Dabalim airfield was soaked with rainwater. Everything was against us, Lieutenant. C.D.R. Yadav recalls. Everything. For a brief moment, he brought up the possibility of ditching in water, the act of landing the plane in a controlled manner on the sea surface, and exiting rapidly in an inflatable boat. The navigator was asked to see if he could spot some ships for IN-305 to ditch close to, so chances of a rescue would be quicker. Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav hated the idea from the moment it left his mouth. He swallowed and waited for a few more minutes, holding the aircraft steady. Then he saw it. The west coast loomed into view through the weather haze. Glancing out of the cockpit, Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav realized they were about to fly over Karwar in Karnataka, a town about 100 kilometers south of Goa and home to one of the Indian Navy's largest warship bases. IN-305 was now over familiar territory, but that brought no comfort at all to the crew on board. If those engines exploded now, they were too low to bail out. And if they were forced to, it was land below them. Well past the point of no return, Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav used both hands to mechanically steady the aircraft. Bereft of electrical power, the control column strained against every bit of pressure from the pilots. Every input was manual. The sweat dripped off the pilots' faces as they fought to control the aircraft in its descent. Then, Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav heard one of the men behind him yell something through the noise. He turned around to see one of the crew brandishing a mobile phone. I grabbed the phone. By some stroke of luck, there was a mobile signal, Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav recalls. The pilot used the mobile to call the Dabalim air traffic control, screaming into the phone a description of IN-305 situation and calling for full preparation on the ground for a possible disaster. Using the mobile phone on board was against procedure, like with civil flights. But Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav knew it was his one lifeline in the event his aircraft hurtled down the Dabalim tarmac with a collapsed landing gear and in a ball of angry flame. Grimly aware of just how slim the chances were, Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav and his crew steadied IN-305 in its final seconds as the runway emerged through the haze. The engine roar increased as the temperature abruptly spiked, threatening to explode just a few feet off the ground. I knew the engines could burst at any time. I shouted to the crew that we had only one chance to make it to the runway. This was do or die, he says. There was no turning back now. The crew of IN-305 held its breath as the aircraft slammed down on the runway. Just seconds before it did, a fresh realization dawned. I remembered we didn't have hydraulics to stop the aircraft. So how do we control the speed? I couldn't shut the engines down either, because they are electrically operated too, Lieutenant. C.D.R. Yadav says. But there was a little known last resort that he recalled out of nowhere. An emergency option had been designed into the Eel 38 that allowed pilots to pneumatically feather the engines, a method to decrease drag and stop the propellers. The option, though, was a terrible risk. The Eel 38 has four engines, two on each wing. If even a single engine was feathered before the other, the aircraft could be thrown violently off its path and into a wreck of mangled metal and flame. Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav looked to his flight engineer, directing him to pull the feathering levers at precisely the same moment. We could have handled a small bit of your oscillating movement on the vertical axis.
but anything extreme would have meant the end of all of us, Lieutenant. CDR Yadav recalls. The feathering worked. As soon as IN-305 touched the tarmac, Lieutenant. CDR Yadav rushed to switch off first the outer two engines and then the inner ones. And with one final vestige of hydraulic power that had built up in the dead aircraft, he controlled it on the tarmac's center line, wrestling to keep it from veering off the runway. Keeping IN-305 on the runway was crucial not only to their own lives but the safety of other personnel and aircraft at Dabalim. After an unforgiving hour in the air, the crew of the Eel-38 met the first friend, Dabalim's unusually long runway, one of the longest in India, that gave the hurtling aircraft the extra distance it needed to slow down and stop without brakes. Around 9,000 feet after touchdown, the aircraft came to a stop. I could see the valley beyond the runway come into view. Luckily we were able to stop the aircraft, he recalls. The roar of the engines had died down, giving way to the sound of emergency sirens as a medical crew called Lieutenant. CDR Yadav and his men from the Eel 38. It was only then, Lieutenant. CDR Yadav says that he fully grasped what had just happened. When you're in the air, all you're doing is solving the problem in front of you, first one, then the next. You've got no choice. You can't see the big picture, only the problem in front of you, he says. That evening, after a mandatory medical check, Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav made his way to his residence at the base. His wife and two young children were at home. The family had made plans to dine at the Naval Officers Institute that evening. But Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav was exhausted. When he told his wife he'd prefer to relax at home, she wasn't surprised. Her husband often came home tired after long airborne missions. It was only the next day when she was asked by other families about the incident that she learnt about what happened on board IN-305. The crew of IN-305 had flown raw, with all possible odds stacked against it. Three years later, when Lieutenant C.D.R. Yadav travelled to Russia on military work, an old designer from the Illusion Design House cornered him at an event to ask about the now legendary flight. In rapt attention, the Russian listened, taking notes, amazed by how the Indian crew had saved themselves and their aircraft. A crucial mission to shadow Pakistani warships remained unfinished on that day. But the lives of eight naval aviators had been saved by what the Indian Navy described as Lieutenant. CDR 19 Yadav's high degree of maturity, composure and a sense of resolve in the face of impending peril. A year later, his leadership on board IN-305 won him the Shaurya Chakra. While IN-305 was grounded for investigation into the failure that nearly doomed its crew, four days later, Lieutenant CDR Yadav strapped into another Eel-38 on an identical mission. This time, a pair of Pakistani warships was transient the other way. The mission is reported to have been a success.